This is Nature 7. One of the most difficult things to do is recalibrate. And our whole lives are stuffed into a number of artificial calibrations that don't jibe. And so we are rarely ever calm and simply at home with ourselves at home with ourselves and our lives, and at home with ourselves and our lives in the world. There is no way to go from any artificial calibration to another artificial calibration and achieve anything like wholeness, much less reality. So at the time tested true wisdom way is one has to go back to nature. And in going back to nature, we don't go back to a calibrated form. We go back to a process which has no calibration. So that nature, as we saw in Nature One, one of the nicest ways to refer to it as Tao or to remind ourselves that it has a zero base and that that zero is not empty, but that the zero is a protein in a sense that it allows for change to occur with the proviso that the change is continuous, it is unbroken. So when we go back to nature for real, rather than going back to some idea of nature, or going back to some feeling that, oh, this is how nature should be, or back to some ritual comportment that we can get back to nature if we go into a monastic existence and observe the uh, monks' times of day, or the nuns' times of day, or that we can go back in some kind of uh, prescribed discipline and by keeping ourselves within the confines of that prescribed discipline get back to nature. None of this ever works. The big difficulty is that in nature change is continuous and not discrete. There are no quanta in that cascade of continuous change. As there develops the bits of the quanta, they turn out to be quanta of energy. And out of this comes the whole term quantum mechanics and physics. Out of these uh, quanta, which are punctuations of zero within the flow that has now achieved emergence as a unity, the Chinese word for that is te, from the zero emerges the one. The unity comes out of nature, and that unity is because it is naturally emergent and its unity is real in terms of the context of nature. It is not a block, but in its continuousness, existence now is punctuated. Punctuated, so that the Te is punctuated by the Tao. The oneness is punctuated by the zero, the zeros, and it doesn't dice things up then into bits so much as each discreteness is now a unity. They are all ones. And because they are all ones, all existential things, all stuff on every level, has an integral quality to its existence. It really is what it is, 
when it is. So that the flow of nature is like a f energy which has a frequency and as it flows as a punctuation in the existentials, the bits of stuff that really now are unified, what happens is that there is an expansion, an expansion of the ones <laughs> and of the extent of the zeros and out of this you begin to get a fabric which is since Einstein called space time it's more advisable to call it time space because time is not the fourth dimension there but the first. So that time space is an expansion of the discreteness of ones punctuated by the continuous zero Tao energy change of nature. So that existence is quite natural and existentials are really natural. They are not specifically nature but they are natural. And so for us to be able to recalibrate ourselves, to come back to reality, to learn to be real, to learn so that our real being, our real person, as it were, is real in a real life, in a real world. And that the context for this is not only nature, but the emergence into the ritual actions of existence. We've been looking for six weeks and now we're on the seventh week, at the beginning of our learning, at the beginning of this process, and the characteristic that works, the magic that really prevails and obtains is to stay with it. To stay with the process of continuity, with the continuousness. That change here is not a change of form, only in formal objectivity would change be a change in form. In nature there is no change in form because it is a process and not a form. So that the continuousness of it, the continuity of it, is not discernible as something. It's not discernible as stuff, as things. And so there is a natural illusion by looking at existentials and thinking that, that that is nature. They are natural originally, but they are in no way nature. So that there is an odd quality. It's usually in normal language called magic. The magic of nature that one, uh, sees the, uh, as one of the writers on Africa, saying every time that she would leave Europe and come back to Mombasa on the coast of um, Kenya, what was at one time British East Africa, and uh, take a lorry inland towards Nairobi and to see the sunset and the African thorn umbrella trees and the giraffe silhouettes against the sky by the hundreds and the vastness of Africa that she was uh, transported back into uh, that the world was truly magical. That nature has a charisma and in this uh, charisma it evokes in us, appeals to us that we also have this. We don't have it different from nature but we have it in participation with nature. So that there is a resonance, a resonance in the existentials because we all are in the same flow of nature. And to participate then in that flow gives us a chance to go back and we recalibrate not in terms of any system or any doctrine or of any expectation or assumption, 
or presupposition, the list is actually very long. We participate in primordiality, primalness. And one of the great characteristics of Africa is that it presents this primordiality uh, almost to uh, anyone who would go there except in the last 50 years, 40 years, it has been sullied a great deal by overlays of artificiality. At one time, North America was primordial like this and it was not that long ago. Even just 200 years ago, it was still possible for a couple of men, Lewis and Clark, to go across the North American continent and be amazed at what was there and no one had seen it who was not just a native here for many thousands of years. The first Europeans to actually go and encounter uh, animals and sites and so forth. So just even 200 years ago, North America was a primordiality. As one great early American writer of that period uh, said in one of his great novels called uh, The Pathfinder. The Pathfinder is taking a group of people in upper New York State to a place of rendezvous and in order to get his bearings he climbs a great huge tree an enormously old thick gnarled tree very high and when he gets to the very top Hawkeye Deerslayer Pathfinder looks out and James Fenimore Cooper says he looked upon an ocean of primordial forest as far as he could see in every direction unbroken for a thousand miles. And that was with in uh, just very recent times. Our first beginnings were with Thoreau, and Thoreau was someone who could go back to the primordiality of nature, back to the process of nature. And though he was born in 1817, and we think of him as being from a very sophisticated small town Concord Massachusetts place when he was a boy there were still Indian tribes that would come and camp out on the Concord River set up their teepees and have their powwows and have their ceremonies and so as a boy Thoreau learned uh, what it was to be uh, primordial in the forest that was there still remnants of it there. And all his life had this quality of being able to recognize objects that would emerge magically from that primordiality, leaves, insects, birds' eggs, arrowheads. All of them were quanta that emerged out of the Tao of the primordial uh, America. And all of his life, Thoreau apprenticed himself to Indians in the sense that he would go to places like Maine and for weeks on end would go camping and hiking with an old Indian man and he would go to the highest uh, mountain, Mount Catan in uh, northern uh, Maine and just be out there in the wilderness by himself. And so when Thoreau would come back to Concord, though in the popular mind he was often confused and made an apprentice of Ralph Waldo Emerson, Emerson never had that primordiality. He never had that quality of being able to go back to nature pristinely like Thoreau did, and so there was a vast difference between the two of them. When the inheritor of Thoreau, uh, a man named John Muir, who founded the uh, Sierra Club, John Muir, one of the great naturalists of all time, 
who was able to go back to primordiality, who understood that while Thoreau had been primal in the east, northeast coast of America, uh, Muir explored the rest of the continent. He went to Alaska. He went especially to the Sierra Nevada, to Yosemite, and was one of the first human beings to ever be primordial there in those places. He records in his book on the Yosemite of having climbed down uh, from the top of uh, El Capitan and uh, to get a, a better view of the valley and how the sun all of a sudden was setting and he realized that it was very late in the day and so he started to scramble to try to get back and he realized that he'd been clinging so long that he uh, was losing the strength of his hands, the strength of his uh, legs, that he wasn't going to make it. And so he shifted, he recalibrated back into just letting himself be with nature, undifferentiated. And he said, without any effort at all, I just simply climbed back up and stood at the top. Primordiality is a magic in its deep mysteriousness. And for those few human beings who can do this, not just once or twice through some gift of a moment, but because of the capability of their being to go back uh, at any time, not at will, but at any time, and there are some who can go back continuously. Not at all times, but forever before time occurs, before space occurs. And so there is that capacity of being mysterious. And we saw that with, paired with Thoreau, the ancient Chinese sage Fu Shi, the dragon man, the originator of the trigrams that became the I Ching, was such a primordial person. Went back uh, primordially, completely. And another figure that we're putting into our educational swirl in nature, Lao Tzu was able to do that too, to go back continuously without a break. And when one learns that the original Tao Te Ching was delivered orally with no punctuation other than the way in which words formed themselves in this cascade of language, 5,500 Chinese words without any punctuation delivered to Yi Xin, the keeper of the Hanku Pass through which the old Lao Tzu was riding off into the West. For China, like ancient Egypt, the West was the uh, secret paradise. The Western paradise of later Amitabha Buddha, the early paradise of the far West, because this is where the queen mother of the West, the keeper of immortality, the fruit tree of immortality, the peach, that she lived. And so there is this quality in our education of taking at the beginning exemplars who are able to go back to nature, Thoreau and Fuxi, and we'll come up to um, Lao Tzu when we uh, come to the interval uh, after 12 weeks of looking at pairs of texts, we'll take the Tao Te Ching by itself and experience, if we can, the very experience in English, in poetic English, of what a primordiality from ancient China would sound like. Along with Thoreau and the I Ching, in the first four lectures, we are taking a deeper step, deeper into the penetration back to nature with Mary Leakey and Jane Goodall. Whereas Thoreau went back to the primordiality of the American Indians, some 10 to 20, 
thousand years old, and Fushi went back to the primordiality of uh, China. Homo sapiens have lived in China for about a hundred thousand years, and Beijing man lived in the vicinity of Beijing, China, 500,000 years ago. So that there is a quality of going back thousands of years, and now with Mary Leakey and Jane Goodall, we're going back millions of years. And starting with Nature 9, we're going to go back billions of years. Thousands, millions, billions. Each time deepening our wave of return to go back to primordiality. And as we go back to primordiality at a deeper, deeper level, the expansion of the frequency of the continuous energy of our learning will achieve in three great steps, three great plateaus, that quality that uh, John Muir had, that we are not so desperately lost if we will recalibrate back and let the zeros flow through all the existentiality of ourselves, it works effortlessly. And that learning then becomes a completely different quality. It is no longer instruction or inculcation. It's no longer trying to find out something, but rather to disclose and discover. Mary Leakey's book, Disclosing the Past. Her quality of being able to go back was something that she had as a girl, and we saw how she was exposed, even as a young girl, to Paleolithic art in France. She was one of the first people to ever go into some of the caves like Pec Merrill that were 25,000 years old and to see pristinely with the old uh, Abbey uh, Lemusi taking her and her mother back into this uh, cave. The father, an artist, was afraid to go back that far underground in tight quarters. And in fact, in the uh, later uh, decades, they made a new entrance to uh, uh, Peck Merrill because it was so scary to go back in much like they did with the uh, cave at uh, Cosquer, discovered about uh, 10 years ago on the French coast, not far from Marseille, about uh, 130 feet underwater and 400 feet through muddy sediment, uh, curved cracked tunnel, and up into a cave that had not been seen by human beings for 25,000 years, and the cave art itself goes back to 35,000 years ago, within cell phone distance of Marseille. <laughs> so that the primordiality of nature is everywhere, but our generation has a very peculiar gift, not just a challenge, but a gift. We are the first generation that can go into space that can go as one of the first human beings who ever did it, Ed White, when he was on the extra vehicle activity, the EVA, from his Gemini capsule. And he went out of the Gemini capsule and he was one of the first human beings to go out into space in his spacesuit. Not in the protocol of the orbiting capsule, not like Gagarin or Titov or anybody before him. He was the first man to go out as a human being in his own suit, in his own form. And he looked back and held his hand up, and his hand eclipsed the entire Earth. And he looked down, and Ed White saw his umbilical life system, which went snaking back like a vacuum cleaner hose into the Gemini capsule, but it was coated with real gold. And 
he looked out and saw the universe pristinely and felt the magic. And it was many, many minutes and many demands later, Mission Control in Houston telling him to go back into the capsule, to come back into the capsule. There was no response from him other than that. It was magnificently mysterious. And finally, his co-pilot in the Gemini capsule on secret command from Mission Control, McDivitt pulled him back in because it was apparent that Ed White was not going to go back into the womb. He had been born into the mysteriousness of the universe. And he was the first man on this planet to ever experience that and to know that. Unfortunately, uh, Commander White uh, perished in Apollo 1, the flash fire that killed him and Gus Grissom and uh, Roger Chafee. Our learning is not just an instruction. Our learning is an experience deeper than experience. It's the process of going back and re-participating in primordiality. And part of the trick in this, part of the magic in this, is to do it continuously as much as one can. To bring oneself not into conjunction with nature, but into a continuous participation with nature. So that one's activities, one's actions, one's movements become au naturel, but in a continuous mode. A great French philosopher who had understood this had done it himself, Henri Bergson, called it uh, durée, creative duration. That time was not at all something that was ticks of bits in a sequence, but that it was a creative duration uh, that was uh, unbroken whatsoever. Henri Bergson's uh, beautiful sister, Moira, married uh, one of the most uh, pretentious uh, esoteric uh, figure, occult figures of the time, uh, McGregor Mathers, who did books on the Kabbalah and so forth. And uh, when he had a chance to uh, understand from Henri Bergson, he thought, well, this is just a university professor of philosophy and didn't get it and didn't understand it. Whereas one of the figures who did talk with Bergson and did understand W.B. Yeats, uh, later on uh, dismissed McGregor Mathers from the Golden Dawn because he had no dawning. Mm -hmm. He didn't understand. It was Yeats also that threw Aleister Crowley out of the uh, Golden Dawn. He said occult um, groups are uh, wisdom schools, not reform schools. <laughs> We're not out to correct someone or correct the world so it fits their demands. That's not occult, that's simply childish. It's not esoteric, it's simply stupid. And we live in an age and a time where very few people have been able to discern the childishness and the stupidity from uh, the deep mysteriousness. Aleister Crowley, is a faker, <laughs> whereas someone like Thoreau is quite real. My spirit mother knew Crowley very well, and she said he had a deep weakness. He could intimidate anyone with his occult stuff, but he had a, a child, a boy's sense of humor. So she said when things would get a little too uncomfortable, she would make him laugh, and he would collapse into this, uh, oh well, I really didn't mean it. I'm just, you know, playing my game, doing my stuff, looking severely occult, M but he was never mysterious. Whereas my spirit mother was as mysterious as you can be. She once was 
reviewing one of my symbol students who had learned to read tarot cards pretty well and uh, but was a natural thief. She took an ordinary deck of playing cards and turned them over face down and then just through a primordiality of counting, she read his uh, fortune with the natural playing cards face down and discovered that he had stolen some little item from her and she said, put it back. And he absolutely uh, freaked out and dropped it out of his uh, cape pocket and ran out of the house and uh, we never saw him again. There are persons who can return back to the primordiality and be there, and they do not need to have the counters that the mind thinks it needs in order to read what's real. Someone like Thoreau could go to the forests and could uh, read uh, the great uh, book of nature, as they used to call it, could read the seasons. The same with Mary Leakey. She had this deep quality, and while her husband, Louis Leakey, had it also, he had it on a level that went down to the tribe, to the Kikuyu tribe. He was an elder, a white elder, one of the few white elders ever of an African tribe. But Mary Leakey went all the way back to primordiality. She was able to go back, and in such a way, she describes in her book on uh, Old Duvai Gorge, she describes a, um, a curious thing that people, when they began to hear that remnants of humanity, millions of years old, had been found, they would begin to come. I guess the tourists numbered several hundred until the National Geographic began funding them, and then uh, all of a sudden they would have more than 25,000 people a year come to visit, and now it is just uh, one of the largest uh, tourist attractions in the world. And she says in her book, they always ask the same question, how do you know where to dig? And she says, it isn't like we put down chance pits and hope to find something there and just keep doing that. She said that she and Lewis together, they went off to Africa in uh, 1937, January of 1937. She said it was a very special, magical thing. Lewis had been married before, had had a couple of children with a woman before, was the son of Canon Leakey, so that he was uh, uh, supposed to behave himself, and yet he and Mary just simply, as soon as they discovered each other, went off to live in a little cottage together. And eventually a divorce came, and Lewis was offered a couple of years in uh, Kenya, and he and Mary went off. And she says in her book, people who think everything out in minute detail before agreeing to a project often end up by concluding it is too risky and too difficult to undertake. Lewis and I had already developed a relationship of mutual trust in which our philosophy was not to fret over difficulties, but to accept opportunities and overcome obstacles as they presented themselves using whatever resources were to hand at the time. The more and more that the two of them, when they went back to Africa, went back to Kenya, originally they noticed their qualities. They were on a boat on Lake Victoria, the, the largest freshwater lake in the world, huge, with real waves at times. And there was this island called Rusinga Island in Lake Victoria. And as they were going past it, the two of them began talking and saying, I feel 
that there is something to be found there on that island, some ancient trace of man uh, that no one has ever found. And they uh, found that the two of them together had a similarity. And that if they braided their similarity together, it tended to become a focus. But because it was not a focus that was static, it was a focus that coursed along the energy frequency. It meant then that as long as they participated in nature and kept that frequency alive, it would begin to illuminate the landscape so that whatever was there existentially in that landscape would begin to call out to them as well as they see it. So that the whole process is not one of identification at all. Shakespeare used the correct term. He said, in reality, it is well met. <laughs> not just identified. Let's take a break. <coughs> Continuity not continuity of sequence, not continuity of application, not continuity of instruction, continuousness. In mathematics it's called a continuum. Uh, Dover Paperbacks has Hermann Weil's beautiful little monograph on the continuum. The continuum not only has zero as its calibration, it likewise, in deep, deep logic, has infinity as a calibration as well. So that in a very mysterious way, one is the fulcrum between zero and infinity. It seems peculiar, and it is most peculiar, that existence is a fulcrum, and that the fulcrum of the existential has objectivity because zero and infinity as the contexts have undergone an emergence into a polarization which allows for one to occur in a very special way. That it can be stated not only one, but it can be stated one over one. One over one equals one. But because it can be written, because it can be thought one over one, Unity is capable of a ratioing. And because it's capable of a ratioing, existentials have a proportional structure that can be teased out of their unity. To insist that logic be limited to identities obviates all the rest of the possibilities in the universe. It is impossible to learn anything for real on the basis of expecting that you're smart because you can identify and that those who can identify quickest and mostest are the smartest. This is a peculiarity. The word for it is hubris, pride. So our education, being real and realistic, goes back to this primordiality, that continuity, that continuum, which Fushi and Thoreau found, and which Mary Leakey and uh, Jane Goodall likewise found. In Mary Leakey's um, book, Disclosing the Past, we talked earlier about how she and Lewis 
discovered that they were very similar and that their intuitive frequencies, the energy of their lives, was braidable. And as long as they kept it uh, coursing, and they did this for 30 years, there was a ratioable magic of insight between the two of them that allowed them to tease possibilities out of nature that were not discoverable before. One could even say it's stronger, and I think I will. They were not there before. Here's an example. They had been at this point in Africa for about 10 years. They'd been through a lot. They went in January of 1937, and of course a great deal of that time was because of the Second World War and Germany in the Second World War was a big power in that part of Africa, German East Africa. There was even a German gunboat on Lake Victoria. They made a movie of it uh, called The African Queen about the sinking of that gunboat, Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn. So that part of Africa was in turmoil all this time and just about uh, up to enter into a deeper turmoil of the Mau Mau threat. So the Africa that they were in was not at all the picture book Africa. And it was a very difficult time, except that Mary and Lewis together, he being a a real African, a native African. There's not only such a thing as a white African, there are white Indians. Thoreau was a white Indian. The protagonist of James Fenimore Cooper's uh, Leatherstocking Saga was a white Indian. In The Deerslayer, written in 1851, Cooper has 17-year-old Deerslayer, after he'd written the other four novels, ending with The Prairie, when Natty Bumpo was in his 80s and died alone out on the prairie, went out to die by himself. But in The Deerslayer, 17-year-old white Indian, raised by the Mohicans, <laughs> is running through the forest laughing silently because he knew you don't make a sound. You can't hunt if you make sounds. But he had this sense of humor, this European sense of humor, but he had the Mohican sense of being able to run full blast through the forest, not run into anything. And that's how that uh, novel began. And the image that sometimes one is at home in the mystical participation of the mystery of nature so that you are seamless. The trees know who you are. The animals know who you are. The minerals know who you are. The rocks know who you are. The sky, the weather knows who you are. You don't just read the weather, you are with that weather. You know what it is. Mary Leakey, in 1948, was with Lewis. They were able to cross over. She said, I had not long left Lewis when I saw some interesting looking bone fragments lying on the sloping surface and letting my eyes travel upwards, I saw a tooth in the section. It had a hominid look. Could it be, a few moments later, I was shouting for Lewis as loud as I could, and he was coming, running, very gently. We brushed the sediments away from around the tooth. It was true. Not only was it a proconsul tooth, but it was in place in a jaw. And although the specimen was undoubtedly warped and in many fragments, it was clear that a considerable part of the facial area 
and rather more than half the skull were present. This was a wildly exciting find which would delight human paleontologists all over the world for the size and shape of a hominid skull of this age so vital to evolutionary studies could hitherto only be guessed at. Ours were the first eyes ever to see a proconsul face or, to be strictly accurate, the bony structure that had supported it. And just a generation later, you find the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Human Evolution and has the ancient, archaic, humane face. And even beyond that, one finds books like this one. This is um, the American Museum of uh, Natural History, uh, the first humans. Human origins and history to 10,000 BC, or from Lucy to language. And you find, right at the beginning, before the title page, you find the kinds of discoveries that the Leakeys pioneered for the first time. They were the first people to ever do this. And it wasn't like climbing Mount Everest for the first time. No one believed any of this. The standard was that uh, man was created uh, 4004 BC. That's what Bishop Usher in Ireland computed reading the Old Testament that Adam was created 4004 BC, I think in September. <laughs> and being an Irish a prelate, he figured out the time. So that one can be sure that uh, this is how things are. And it was uh, uh, deeply disturbing to people to have anyone mention that there are things before. The Scopes trial in Tennessee in 1926 was over teaching evolution in the schools. That was only 20 years before finding this. They did a beautiful film of it called Inherit the Wind with Spencer Tracy playing uh, Clarence Darrow and uh, Gene Kelly in a non-dancing role playing H.L. Mencken and uh, William Jennings Bryan who defended uh, the uh, prosecution of this uh, teacher who dared teach evolution in the high school uh, was played by uh, Frederick uh, March. Classic film. Part of the incredibleness of it is that this discovery in 1948 was right in the middle between 1937 and 1959, and it was the only time in that long 22 years that something like this was found and exciting. And today, out in the African plain, there's a cenotaph of the site, of the spot where Mary found the uh, uh, skull later on that was called Zenjanthropus, that was uh, Australopithecus uh, Bosai, was a further development from a proconsul who was more ape than man, and yet when you got to Australopithecus Bosai, called Zenjanthropus at that time by the Leakeys, it, it was amazing because one saw that though there were missing links still, that one began to have the sense that there was a proportion. There was a ratio. That the unity of man was not just an identifiable one, but that the unity of man was a proportional ratio that went back in its unity to different expressions of it. And that as one would go back or forward from the first discovery and then the second discovery, one began to understand that it wasn't as if there was just one note, man, but that there was a way to fret the instrument of creation so that it began to have a lot of different notes and that you could play a composition of music on it. 
that we are not one note that God sings once and that's it, but that there's a whole music to creation. That existence is a, a symphonic, incredible reserve of all kinds of musics and that we were for the first time being able to go back primordially enough to hear music now that wasn't just thousands of years old, but millions of years old. It was a great, great, great step. And without that step, we would not be able to be in the position we are today in the early 21st century to understand that existence is billions of years old. That life is not scarce in the universe, it's endemic to it. And that the source of water is not out of the ocean of the earth, but that every comet and every star system in the universe carries a lot of water with it and that's how water collects on bodies. How does there get to be an ocean 100 miles deep on a moon of Jupiter like Europa? Because of cometary impacts that collected there because of the gravity and all of the dynamics of Europa and also Ganymede and even Callisto all have oceans. It is endemic. Life is a part of existence. Organics exist even in interstellar dust. The list of organic molecules detected in interstellar gas clouds now exceeds uh, more than 100. We would not at all be in a position to survive our own uh, truncated sense of uh, life that was uh, foisted on us by uh, cookie cutters that are now so rusty and blunt that uh, they uh, dice up and mash up people more than give them definitions. But we have good news because we are able now to see the primordiality of billions of years old and have an interstellar learning like this. It's new. It's just pioneering. And it's true that there's just maybe someone laughing silently running through uh, the forests of the future, but still there nevertheless. And it'll come through. It'll work. One of the great beautiful qualities of this kind of reality is that it's magnetic as well as electric. It not only has the polarity of the electric quality that allows for stability, but it has the magnetic quality as well that allows for resonance. And the most poignant resonance is that the children, both by blood and by adoption, of parents like that acquire those qualities as well. Richard Leakey, now rather fat old man, crippled with operations of losing several legs. Nevertheless, when he was a boy, he would be taken out with his other two brothers. When his mother would be out in Old Dubai Gorge, in Africa, day after day, year after year. And they grew up swimming uh, nude in the little pools and uh, playing with the rocks and just being out there, she with her four Dalmatians and her three sons, a couple of African men who were learning how to do this and she would be out there with her cigars and her pork pie hat and uh, her patience her continuity uh, decades on end. And Richard grew up to have that uh, insight quality that she had. Lewis could tell how things were on an ancient tribal level once they were shown him. And he could work with it and did very well. But Mary could go back to the primordiality of nature itself. And uh, Richard got that. 
And one time he was in a plane flying over the northern uh, stretches of uh, the Rift Valley in uh, Kenya, Lake Turkana, and he looked out of the plane and he noted a sandbar area on the edge of one of the edges of Lake Turkana, and uh, he knew instantly that that was a site. That was where you could go, and you would find what was there, and it would be spectacular. And when he finally mounted an expedition, it was written up by Harvard University Press as the Nereokotomi Homo erectus skeleton of a young boy who lived almost two million years ago. A boy who was almost six feet tall and uh, built like an Olympian uh, uh, runner and uh, obviously able to uh, support himself in hunting all by himself, uh, probably about 17 years old, almost two million years ago. Later, discoveries around the Eurasia African area have shown that Homo erectus was the first species to colonize a large swath of the earth. But they went traveling not just a few miles or 10 miles, but they went thousands of miles throughout the African and Eurasian uh, area, all the way to uh, China, all the way into the uh, areas that uh, were to be covered by glaciers later on, and all through Africa. And uh, so Homo erectus was the first species, many species before Homo sapiens, to be world travelers. So that our heritage in nature is not only just mysterious, it really is mysterious. But part of its mysteriousness is that it is understandable in terms of ratioed, proportional musics that do not obviate unity and also accept zeros and infinities as breather points. So that one of the deepest qualities to the primordiality of any yoga, the Sanskrit word for it was prana. One has to learn to breathe evenly, <laughs> to breathe in exactly the same amount that one breathes out, but that there is a pause after one has breathed in where there's a turn and one begins to breathe out. And then there's another pause, and then one turns and breathes in. And so the breath is not just a one-two process like some kind of mechanical cylinder, but is a four-part process that is punctuated by a zero stillness within and by an infinity of atmospheric context without. And in between the zero and the infinity, one has the balance of the breath, which is an energy frequency of respiration. And from this, once one has this, all calibrations, all resonances, all proportions can be developed from this. The same thing here with the leakies to Mary, uh, leaky to Jane Goodall. In that time period, from 1937, when they began, to the time when Jane Goodall began on her lake shore, Lake Tanganyika, she began in 1960. So it was only 23 years from the beginnings of the Leakeys to the beginning of Jane Goodall. And Jane Goodall has carried it now for almost uh, 45 years herself, and has the Jane Goodall Institute that's all over the world, huge title page, and uh, is enthusing uh, millions of people. Mm -hmm. So that it has gone in just three quarters of a century from only of two people who had never done it, and no one had ever done it, to now it is a natural part of the entire world and is a perspective on the entire world that 
has a further capacities of opening up as we go to other planets and other moons and other star systems and find again and again that the protein qualities of the music of life is that it can occur in almost any variety, even beyond imagination. Uh, Whitman once observed, he said, uh, it seems that nature favors two things, freedom and variety. That's what she likes. She likes us all to be uh, quite different and quite free, and sometimes radically different and sometimes wildly free. And that's okay with her. One of the qualities that was there that Mary Leakey developed was her sensitivity to use the calibration of animals, of animal life, so that one could get into a position of having some kind of a scaler that you could relate then to the living variety of animals and then take that back and go back millions of years to a variety of fauna that uh, no one had ever seen. And so in 1994, when they published volume five of Old Duvai Gorge, Cambridge University Press, uh, Mary Leakey, uh, her whole section here, uh, number seven, is on the fauna. And she talks about how the fauna from beds uh, three and four and the Massac beds is somewhat better known now than it was in 1965 when LSB Leakey wrote a preliminary report on the Old Duvai fauna in volume one of the Old Duvai monographs. And sure enough, when you go to volume one, which came out in 1965, 30 years before, a preliminary report on the geology and fauna one of the qualities here is that the fauna become a calibration for the tribal level of life. The geology is a calibration for the rock level, the planetary landscape level that prepares for that life, that fauna level that can become tribal and not only become tribal, but is tribal all the way back before our kind of hominids, even before the precursors of our hominids, even before the precursors of those precursors, because there are, as we know now from Jane Goodall, there are tribal qualities that are there even in the great apes. And just as Louis Leakey in the preliminary report on the geology and fauna, at Old Duvai Gorge, we saw last week that precursor to this volume was this volume called Animals in Africa, text by Louis Leakey, photographed by Ela. And uh, this was published in London, uh, and it was published in 1954. And uh, Ela, uh, as we talked about uh, last week, an animal photographer, an adventurer, and uh, she uh, would still have been working, but she lost her life photographing wild animals in India uh, to be a complement to this book, Animals in Africa. A very famous uh, photographer in her day, a very courageous uh, woman. She says, 1954, the magic of Africa for which films and books had given me both a desire and a nostalgia actually exists. It is difficult to explain just what your feeling is when driving back to Nairobi in the evening on the tarred road that comes in from Mombasa, you suddenly catch sight of giraffes gazing at you, their silhouettes standing out against the splendor of the sunset. If your habits are fixed by civilization, it is absolutely extraordinary to find yourself moving about on these plains that are peopled by herds of wild animals. There are certain localities where you may see two or 3,000 in a day. And it is astounding to see a herd of zebras or giraffes or different species of antelopes right alongside lions. They all seem to possess a sixth sense. And that, for someone who becomes immersed in this participation, 
that sixth sense begins to occur and to dimension, and the mystery of nature has that kind of a quality. It's like a sixth sense. And it modifies so that one doesn't have perception so much as one has perceiving. One has the act of seeing as well as what you see. And the awareness of the act of seeing along with what you see modulate together. They get a syncopation. It's like the ones in their ratios get punctuated by the zeros and infinities so that when one is aware of perceiving while you're perceiving, uh, that perception now has a, a viable uh, context. We just we say of this that it's existential awareness. That existential awareness is the first tone that establishes the calibration of feeling. All feeling is a music out of the pitch pipe of awareness that is in perceiving while your perception is uh, operating existentially. It's a very, very deep thing. What gets in the way is this. Ila again. If the magic of Africa is real, I have no, no, nevertheless learned too much of the way certain movies were made to go on being myself a good public. Thus, if one stampede of thousands of animals was photographed in Africa, close-ups of zebras leaping over movie stars, or on the other hand, nothing but shots of mules painted with stripes photographed in Texas. That's from uh, King Solomon's Mines. An elephant that tossed a native in the air in an African film epic was a tame elephant from India brought to Africa for the occasion. His tusks had to be lengthened and his ears made larger with pasteboard pulp. In another film, a night fight between a leopard and a man was equally arranged, and it was a dead leopard that was flung upon the actor. And she goes on. Most of the artificiality of the world is like a very bad movie set. And the worst is the false education that happens. Because almost no one gets educated for real. No one has the ability to go back to that primordiality, and yet the yearning for that is always there, not just secret and hidden, but uh, as a, a, a background. And it's only when one gets a whiff of fresh air once in a while that you realize that air can be clean and invigorating. And you don't have to have shallow breathing to get through the smog and the grit. And there is such a thing that one can drink from a stream and not have to boil the water. There is a whole range of images that one can express this. The deepest one of all, though, is the sense of awareness existentially that comes pristinely emergent out of the continuity of mysteriousness of nature. When Jane Goodall went, she was 26 years old. She went because Louis Leakey, like with Yila and Mary Leakey and Jane Goodall's mother, Van, he was always convinced that women were very special, that they had more than men an ability to go back to, uh, to nature, whereas men could go back and become tribal they could go native, as the British used to say, but they couldn't very easily go real. Whereas uh, certain women had the capacity to uh, go real, go back to the mysteriousness. And so he was always looking for these special women because he was tuned for being with Mary all those years. And he found Yila. She died in 1955. So he uh, did a book with uh, Jane's mother, Van, V-A-N-N-E, and I'll bring it uh, next week. I think I've showed it previously. And then he realized that uh, Jane herself had this quality. 
And so not only Jane, but uh, Diane Fossey, Barit uh, Giltas, one sent to study the orangutans in uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, the other sent to study the highland gorillas, and Jane sent to study the chimpanzees, so that all the great apes would be investigated at the same time by these primordial women able to go back. And it took Jane four years, as we said, before there was any way that the contact was made, and it wasn't made that she identified the chimpanzees, but that she was accepted by them as much as she came to them, they came to her. At the very moment when we get to myth, we'll see uh, uh, in Greek, ancient, uh, archaic Greek, it was called drominon. It means the act done. That there are times when an act is done like the ringing of a bell, that the resonances are heard everywhere in the universe, not just here at the event, but all the way through time, space, all the way through awareness, world without end. And it was when this little baby chimpanzee, who was named Fifi, touched the tip of Jane's nose. And that chimpanzee lived for 40 years, and Jane got to see the children of Fifi. And the children of Fifi were always the most talented because they had a special investigative quality to them that the other chimps didn't quite seem to have. That there is something inheritable, maybe not through genetics so much, but inheritable through resonance. That as long as it is nurtured and cared for, it can be passed on just as well. And so the uh, grandchildren of uh, Fifi uh, are the stars of uh, the chimpanzee tribe uh, of Gombe Stream area uh, today. And Jane can go back and uh, see them, knows them all. They know her. They groom her, though she doesn't have fur, and she grooms them. She became a, a white chimpanzee. We're going to be not in an alien universe, but we're going to be at home in a very, very vast new mansion. Our grandchildren will be there. Part of the tone of this education is to get us back so that the calibration begins with nature in its mysterious continuity and to allow for the emergence from that of whatever is going to come out. Be sure and listen to the music that goes with this. The composer took the songs of humpback whales and made a symphonic piece, Alan Hovannis. And the world made great whales, and God uh, created great whales, he called it. There is a whole tone in everything that we're using, and along with the music, we're using films to try to bring across this uh, contact with primordiality. One of them is John Cocteau's The Beauty and the Beast. Another is the science fiction film Forbidden Planet, where the beast is the beast within, called out by machines left by the Krell some two million years before on a planet in the Altair star system. They're all kinds of things, of enchantments of different scales. And to go back just 40,000 years ago, Iceman, a 40,000-year-old man who was found and brought back to life, and then crater mass in the pit, where they find traces five million years old of Martians that came to the Earth and changed the great ape structures that led to the, our development. So there are all kinds of possibilities that are there, and it's the magic, the enchantment, the invitations that if you will participate in the process of nature with these invitations, the rest of this uh, great uh, adventure is there. It will work. 
and I believe that this time it will work uh, better than ever. It is uh, enriched beyond belief. More next week.